Hi, good morning, good afternoon. Welcome all uh, to this webinar on the core of customer centricity. We'll just wait for a few minutes for, for people to trickle in. And, and as you're joining, uh, feel free to drop a note in the chat where you're joining from. Uh, you're being hosted here by Shari, who's dialing in from London. Uh, my name is Pontus, I'm dialing in from Finland, despite my background, which indicates otherwise. And Meredith is providing support and she's dialing in uh, from the Boston area. All right, perhaps we can, um, we can make a start. Um, so if Meredith, we can go to the next page. Uh, so as we get started here, just a few housekeeping points. Um, webinar is being recorded. We will plan to share the pages and the link to the recording with you all after this session. Um, audio lines are muted, but we, we really encourage comments um, and discussion using the chat function, um, questions using the Q&A function. We will have some dedicated time uh, for Q&A towards the end of the session, um, but we do encourage folks to post questions as they arise. Um, we will also have a couple of poll questions um, throughout the discussion here, which we invite you to answer. Um, if we can go to the next page, uh, I just want to start off by saying a couple of short words about Intersight. We're, we're going to keep this very brief, um, recognizing that a lot of you on the call here know us. Uh, so we are a global strategy and innovation consulting boutique um, founded at the turn of the century by the late Professor Clayton Christensen of Harvard Business School, who you see here um, on the screen. Uh, this was shortly after he published a book called The Innovator's Dilemma, which was really the seminal text on this idea of disruptive innovation. And Innersight was Clay's vehicle for taking his ideas out of academia and into the corporate world. Um, many people here might know that, but what some people uh, don't know is that Clay used to say that disruptive innovation was only the second best idea that he worked on. Um, with the best one being the notion of jobs to be done based customer centricity. And that idea is really at the heart of what we're going to talk about with you all today. Um, so with that, Pontus, I'll hand back to you to get us stuck in. Uh, thanks, Shari. And Meredith, if you can go to the next one, thank you. So our, we started thinking about this, this topic of, of customer centricity during a project with a, with a large international healthcare company. And in those discussions, we, we came across customer centricity a lot, but it was rather the absence or the, the misunderstanding around customer centricity that troubled the leadership team uh, of this organization. And they said in, in different ways, they said that customer centricity was a top priority for them, but they didn't really have a common definition and they didn't all agree on, on what it meant or, or how to operationalize it. And, and that was the genesis of some of this thinking. As, as Shari mentioned, Clay had been thinking about these topics already earlier, but, but this is how we got uh, really in, into, the, into the heart of the question of, of what, is, what is customer centricity and why is it so uh, difficult, at least for some organizations, to, to understand and to operationalize? The concept itself seems quite simple. Customers are the reasons companies exist and, and, and we exist to serve customers. And so we want to be customer centric. It, it seems really quite quite simple, but but this question of a common definition and an underlying methodology to operationalize customer centricity was something we found that that many companies uh, you know struggled with, and and we tried to tried to put some some thoughts together to to help address that that question. And we drew some inspiration from Six Sigma, which is as as many of you know, I'm sure, kind of. A, a quality, a programmatic way to approach quality used in, in often in industry and in other, other disciplines as well. But it has a very clear definition around, around what it means. And it has a methodology for identifying the sources of, of quality problems and then, and then fixing them. So that's how we, we got started. And, 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 and that was kind of the genesis of, of some of this thinking. And if we go to the next, next slide, And there's no there's no shortage of books and and definitions around customer centricity and and I don't think we've read all of them but what we have read a lot of them and there's a lot of very good thinking here and and of course uh, you know the the definitions you know putting the customer at the center of the strategy and developing a customer centric culture 
operationalizing empathy and customer insights, mapping customer journeys. These are all these are all reasonable and, and good things, but it also explained to us why executives often struggle with this because there are so many definitions and there's so many different ways of, of thinking about this. And often the absence of a, of a common, common language and a methodology uh, makes, it, makes it very difficult. Uh, and, and then depending on what people have read, they might define or emphasize different aspects of, of what they think customer centricity is. So we try to uh, perhaps uh, simplify uh, and get to the, to the root of customer centricity as, as, the, as the topic suggests, the core of customer centricity uh, for this webinar. So let me, let me pause there and, and, and Meredith, if you go to the next uh, slide, We'll we'll take the first poll and Shari, if you can if you can introduce this and uh, and we'll have people uh, jump in. Yeah. So uh, our first poll question um, is: Does your organization have an aligned definition and methodology for operationalizing customer centricity? Um, so the poll should now uh, be appearing on your screens um, imminently if it hasn't already. Please do select your response, ranging from strongly disagree if your organization really doesn't have an aligned definition and methodology for this um, through to strongly agree if you are you know at your desired state and once you've selected please do hit submit oh. I'm just going to give a few moments here okay there's still some folks who haven't replied so if you haven't do uh do fill in your response i think we're we're pretty much there, Shari. Couple more. Good. Um, we have a good number of responses. Can we, Meredith, share the results, please? Okay, so what do we see? We see that most there's there are some twenty five percent who agree that their organization does have a have a aligned definition and an ability to operationalize, but there is some scope for for improvement and optimization. But a pretty clear majority is either either strongly disagrees disagrees or is is neutral. What would, what would you make of that, Shari, of these results? Un unsurprising, I think, um, based on, a, you know, much of what we see when we interact with companies. And, and to the point earlier, Pontus, about, you know, the sheer breadth of definitions and methodologies that are out there, um, it, you know, isn't, isn't all too surprising that very different perspectives end up within organizations. Uh, indeed. And, and again, uh, some organizations have been working on this topic for a longer time, and 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 they might might be more mature, and, and others are are just getting uh, getting started on the journey. So it's it's interesting. It does, as as Shari mentioned, does also uh, align with with what we've seen in the field. Uh, it's it's not a new topic, as we mentioned, and and people have been thinking about this, but but there is still a degree of ambiguity and perhaps you know some confusion at least. Uh, uh, in, in some companies uh, on this on this important topic, so I think I think this this webinar, uh, in light of these results, is 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 timely and and hopefully useful uh, to to everyone who is who is participating. Okay, I think uh, Meredith, we can we can stop sharing. I think folks saw the results and and we won't dwell on them too much. Uh, if we close the the poll and and we uh, we advance to the next slide, we'll get uh, we'll get stuck in the uh, uh, the content, and so our take on customer centricity is is anchored on this concept of jobs to be done, and and jobs is is something that's that's been around for for decades. And the, the short definition is the problem someone is trying to solve or address in a particular circumstance. And Clay, uh, as Shari mentioned, worked a lot on the topic of jobs, and, and there were others also who contributed to the development of the IP. And, and we sometimes use this example of, of the drill and a hole. And, and Ted Levitt, who was a legendary Harvard Business School professor, once said that people don't want to buy a quarter inch drill, 
they want a quarter inch hole. But we might say that even that's not fully accurate because people don't want the hole just for its own sake. They may want to hang a uh, painting on the ceiling or they may need to fix something in their house and, and they need to make a hole for, for, that, for that project. So actually, if we were to interrogate, why do people want a quarter inch hole? You know, we, we might come up with a lot of different jobs to be done and different circumstances. Someone might want to hang a painting because they want to make their house look pretty because they have guests coming over and they want to impress them. Uh, or, or maybe they're just fixing something that's broken and, and in that context that they, they need a hole. And we anchor everything uh, in our thinking on, on jobs because companies really exist to address customer problems. That's the reason they exist. They solve customer problems and different companies have different types of solutions. And, and so jobs for us is this is fundamental unit of analysis of what, what is the problem that, that, that a customer wants to address or solve in a, in a particular circumstance. And we don't use the word problem just because like wanting, having to wake up in the morning or, or needing to get from A to B is, you could, you could call it a problem if you like, but, but the jobs to be done language is more neutral. What's the task that people want to address? What's the job that they want to get done? Or if you like, what's the problem that they like to solve? And so that's, that's kind of the first anchoring piece that jobs uh, is this foundational methodology around customer problems. And now Shari is gonna, gonna take us through how jobs relates directly to customer centricity. So, so understanding the problems that customers are trying to get done in their lives and the reason why jobs is such a powerful lens is that it really helps explain what causes the relationship between a customer and a company. Um, so, you know, just to put it slightly differently, consumers and organizations, consumers in B2C settings, organizations in B2B settings, only become customers when they have a job to be done that a company provides a solution to. Uh, and to explain that, just using a very, very simple example, Pontus might be a Starbucks customer because he has a job to be done relating to having a morning ritual that makes him feel awake and energized. And the solution that Starbucks provides is very well suited to that job. Absent either the job to be done that Pontus has as a potential customer or the solution that Starbucks provides, the customer company relationship between Pontus and Starbucks wouldn't exist. Um, so what the chart here on the left is showing is that a customer who in this case is a consumer um, has a really broad universe of jobs that they need to get done, problems that they need to solve in various aspects of their lives. And that's the blue shaded space, the blue bubble. Um, that universe of jobs is served by a very large number of companies with really distinct solutions. And those are the red bubbles. Um, and to bring this to life a little bit, we invite you to sort of think about the number of companies whose solutions inside and outside of your homes that you interacted with just today. And that number probably extends into the hundreds. Now, none of those companies understand or serve you holistically as a customer, but rather they focus on serving specific jobs to be done that you have. Now, what this all means is that focusing on the customer, as the term customer centricity implies, can actually be really quite challenging because no one company can understand and much less hope to serve a customer holistically, just given the sheer number of jobs that they have. So rather the opportunity as we see it is to shift from an orientation of customer centricity towards one of customer jobs centricity in which we really deeply understand and serve customers in the context of specific jobs to be done or problems that they have um, to solve within, the, the, within their lives. Um, Pontus, I don't know if you have anything to, to add to that. Yeah, I, I think that there's a great, uh, great summary. And, and, and someone might say, well, isn't that just a nuance? And isn't that kind of obvious? But what we find is that, that a key question that, that companies have to be very explicit about is what are the boundaries within which they're going to serve the customer because you can always push the boundaries you can always expand and you can always do more for your customer but but really setting those boundaries is is critical mm -hmm. and also 
in what context do you understand your customer? You know, because the customer, as, as Shari said, has many facets, both in the B2B and B2C setting. And, and, and very quickly, you are at the heart of strategy and, and you're faced with another question that Ted Levitt asked, which is, what business are you in? In his famous article, Marketing Myopia. And, and another way to put that question is, what jobs to be done should you be solving for a given, given customer? Uh, back back to you, Shari. Good. So, um, uh, Meredith, we can go to the next page. Um, just extending uh, on from the previous one. Um, so, uh, to the point Pontus made, companies need to think about and identify specific jobs that they're going to solve. Um, beyond that, they also need to be really thoughtful about which jobs can they solve competitively. And here we're defining a customer centric organization as one that identifies where their capabilities, their sources of competitive advantage, the relationships that they have, um, where those intersect with customer jobs um, in a way that does not intersect or intersects as little as possible with competitor solutions. So if you think about automotive companies, for example, there's loads and loads of them. Um, but some of them have chosen to play in parts of the market that are really specific to their, you know, um, assets, capabilities, sources of competitive advantage in a way that solves customer jobs, but does not necessarily intersect with those of, of, of rival players. Now, the question of which jobs we should address is, is actually a really, really strategic one. Um, it's really complex. It's multifaceted. It depends certainly on, you know, the jobs that consumers have and customers have also on the assets and capabilities that we have, which means we can solve them in differentiated ways. Um, the answer to the question of which job should we solve actually also changes over time due to a concept that we call value migration, which um, Pontus is going to talk us through in just a moment. Um, before we go there, Pontus, I'd love to know if you have anything to add here. No, I, I thought that was, that was a great overview. And, and again, this, the, the, I think the reason customer centricity is challenging is because it touches on so many aspects of strategy, competitive positioning, differentiation, uh, but also more tactical things like, like marketing and, and go-to-market uh, 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 approaches. So it, it's a topic which, which spans a very broad segment of, of business questions. And I think that's partly the reason it, it is a source of, 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 of a degree of confusion. But I think that was a good good coverage of, of this topic that we, we have to find a, a, a space where we can competitively and distinctively address customer jobs. Meredith, if you go to the next slide, of course, the question then arises, why shouldn't companies just keep solving the jobs they're very good at and where they have differentiated capabilities and differentiated assets and, and resources and so on. And, and why should they do anything different? Because that's how they can win, I mean, as we suggested in the previous slide. However, what we've seen time and time again is that when there is a difficult customer job, and in this case, the example is from the pharmaceutical uh, industry, there's a difficult medical disease, uh, difficult to treat disease. And let's say some 15 years ago, there were only two products that, that were good at treating that disease. That was a very profitable segment for a given pharmaceutical company if they were one of these two companies that, that had solutions. However, those margins always attract a lot of competition. And fast forward 15 years and you have 30 solutions that treat that specific uh, disease. And so the margins have declined significantly. So what value migration uh, implies is that anytime there's a high value job and a solution, margins are high and that attracts competition who develop their own solutions for those problems. And then suddenly companies are faced with the fact that just solving this job is no longer profitable enough remembering that to originally address the job was very expensive and they had to develop a lot of uh, specialized capabilities and resources when they were originally doing research on, on, on this drug development. And then, you know, within 10, 15 years or, or often even shorter periods of time, competition catches up and that problem is, is solved, uh, you know, uh, with many other solutions and the margins uh, correspondingly 
uh, are lowered. So companies are constantly in search of difficult jobs to be done that are unsatisfied to some degree because that's where the margins are. And this concept of value migration ties in closely with customer centricity because once we solve a certain customer job to a, to a good, in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a satisfactory way, let's say, then uh, value migrates away and companies often, uh, you know, if, if they don't want to become commodity players, have to then find new problems that they uh, can address. But then we, we remember the previous slide that Shari talked to, you're constantly asking the question, can our organization solve this customer problem in a competitive manner? So that's, that's when you get into the, to the Ted Levitt, what business are you in question? Uh, in other words, what problems should we, should we solve? So value migration uh, it can be a real challenge for companies. And of course, you should identify value migration early on uh, before, before it hits your, hits your bottom line. Shari, anything to, to add to the value migration question before we go to the poll? Well, I'll, I'll just add that this concept um, can, you know, really be quite helpful in understanding how industries, entire industries can become less profitable over time. Uh, and, you know, one, one that just springs to my mind right now is international travel and airlines. Um, I mean, that their profits have been eroded uh, following, you know, a job to be done that they solved very, very effectively of help me travel internationally. Um, we've seen over the years that low cost carriers, you know, increasingly competitive carriers have entered the space and eroded the profits um, of the incumbents there. Um, and you see this in multiple other places, what communications and telecoms, um, a lot of this concept. So this concept can explain a lot of what happens over time when industries get disrupted and their products get commoditized. And, and that brings us, I'll just say one more thing here brings us to the question of innovation because innovation is 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 companies trying to find good problems and good solutions to something that they haven't done before so also innovation ties into this this question of customer centricity and, and jobs to be done good um so we have our second poll question and the question is Thinking about the jobs to be done that your company serves for its customers today, are you currently experiencing or potentially at risk of value migration? And it's a, it's a simple uh, yes or no, um, yes or no question. So we'll give folks just a few seconds here. Still got a few answers coming in. I think we had 28 last time as well. So we can, I think Meredith, we can, we can start to close the poll. This was a rapid fire. And if you can, if you, uh, you're sharing the results as well. Interesting, uh, uh, you know, so, so clear majority, uh, of the respondents say that that value migration is a is a risk or a potential risk in the future, and 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 a, some some one third of, of the respondents uh, say it's not. And of course, there are industries who are in a you know who have a long runway with the with with the problem they're solving, and maybe the technology that enables them to solve that problem, or the resources and and assets they have, and and that's a great place to be. Uh, we would suggest that value migration is is only a matter of time sooner or later it hits all companies even the even the best and the greatest companies have to deal with value migration it is the it is the kind of an eternal law of, of business that competition uh, drives drives the dynamic but uh, but it's interesting that that such a large number uh, of respondents said that that value migration was a, was a real risk we certainly see it in our work uh, almost on a daily basis uh, because we work in the strategy and innovation space. And usually clients come to us when they have these questions of, we need to grow and our core business is not either growing enough or it's not growing profitably enough, where should we go? And then you immediately get into this question of, well, what new customer problems should you solve potentially? And how far from your core uh, are you willing to go to identify new growth uh, and, and profit uh, opportunities. 
Shari, uh, your thoughts here. No, I think um, uh, I, I think you know. Uh, I'll, I'll just echo what you said, which is that over time, um, all companies, industries face um, value migration. I mean, I'll, I'll look at the look at the um, automotive industry, which is increasingly shifting towards a broader range of mobility solutions. I mean, in, in London, the city that I live in, uh, it used to be completely dominated by cars. Now you see e-scooters, e-bikes, all sorts of different solutions you know, um, uh, competing for value within that space um, would be would be really curious um, to hear from folks, perhaps in the in the in the chat box here, um, you know, what industries they're in, what's driving the source of value migration in their industries, to the extent that folks feel comfortable with sh sharing either just with, uh, you know, Pontus and myself using the host and panelists option, or with everyone here on the webinar would love to would love to see thoughts. Good. Um, perhaps we can we can move on to the next page. Sure. Uh, let let's. Uh, this is the last piece of of content that we have, and it's a little bit, uh, I guess you could say, dense. Uh, but but we'll just jump right in. As we were then thinking about customers and how customers think about solutions. Because customer centricity, of course, you have to have a, a good problem. And the other half of the equation is the solution. We then asked, how do customers think about solutions? How do they compare solutions? What's the fundamental unit of analysis? And, and what we're arguing here is that customers think in trade-offs. Every single solution, product, service, or even something that's not a product and service has embedded in it trade-offs. Some things are expensive, but maybe they're good quality. Some things are fast, but maybe they're not so customizable and, and so on and so forth. And, and I sometimes share the story that even when I decide, you know, I have a dog uh, where I live uh, in Switzerland. And, and when I take the dog for a walk, I have a couple of different routes. One route is short, one route is a little bit muddy, one route has, has, has more cars and so on. And so depending on the circumstances, I choose a route with different trade-offs. And, and if you think about all the products and services in the world, all the different car models and all the different types of clothing and, and all the different types of electronics, people, we would argue, don't really look at them, you know, kind of objectively trying to say which is the best, you know, product and so on. They, they choose the trade-offs that are most appealing to them given their backgrounds and preferences and circumstances and so on. And, and what we've done here is we've, we've highlighted what we call meta categories, price and features and functionality, quality, ease of access and so on. And in each one of these customers, when they're choosing solutions, they kind of think about the upper and lower bounds. Like you think about if you're buying, let's say a car or, or whatever, you think about the upper and lower bounds of the budget. You think about the features, you think, you know, things that are nice to have and things that are must have. And then you start to evaluate different options based on these trade-offs. So, so one of the key ideas besides this job-centric customer centricity we, we wanted to share was this idea that the really the fundamental unit we think when you're developing solutions is the trade-off equation. Different customers have, have different preferences and they, they want different trade-offs and companies offer different trade-offs. And, and Steve Jobs famously said that products are packages of emphasis. They do some things very well, they don't do other things at all. They trade off this for that. And he said, it's the job of the company to decide what trade-offs or as he called them emphasis, you are gonna embed in your product. And then he said, if we do a good job, people will buy our products. And if we don't, they won't and everything will work out. Uh, he said that in one of his last interviews in, in 2010, uh, it's a great interview, you can find it on, on YouTube. And, and so as companies think about innovation or product development, either on a tactical or strategic level, they're basically making a decision on what trade-offs are we offering for our customers. And of course, in, in every industry, the, the specific criteria will be different. If you're an engineering company, quality and functionality is something very different than if you're running a restaurant, of course. So you have to define those very carefully. But even if you're a, even if you're a restaurant owner or you're, a, you're an engineering company, you're, you're deciding 
how much quality are we going to offer? What kind of price are we going to offer? What's, what's our brand positioning going to be, et cetera. And, and so that's a, an, an important point. And of course, all these are, are related. So we can't just change the dial on price without affecting the other parts. And we can't just increase quality without affecting the other parts. So they're all interconnected, which makes this tricky. And what makes it even more tricky, Meredith, if you go to the next slide, is that as we start to change the trade-off equation that we offer our customers, it has a direct impact on our business model, on our procurement, manufacturing, quality control, sales, marketing, distribution, everything. And we have certain KPIs we have to hit. We have certain profit margins we have to hit. We have certain capabilities and a certain culture in every organization. And, and once we start changing the trade-off equation more significantly, as we may have to do because of competitive reasons and value migration, we are faced with the reality that we actually have to change some of our internal enablers. And this is when it gets really tricky. And, and this kind of goes to, to Michael Porter, who, who said that trade-offs are at the heart of strategy. And the reason trade-offs are tricky is because often trade-offs are incompatible. So we can't just offer excellent quality or best-in-class quality with the lowest price in the market. It's very unlikely that we'd be able to do that. So we have to carefully calibrate what do we think is a winning trade-off equation for the customer, given the competitive realities, and then what can we internally deliver, given our capabilities, assets, and resources, noting that we can't change them overnight, and it takes time to, to build them up and, and to build the capabilities needed to deliver a certain uh, trade-off equation for the customer. So the trade-off is really two, si two, uh, two sides of the coin. You have the customer trade-offs, and then you have the internal machinery, so to say, that produces uh, those trade-offs for the customer. And, and this is why we think the job of the innovator is so difficult, because it's this balancing act of saying, companies exist to address customer jobs. Customers think in trade-offs, but the trade-offs that we produce have immediate implications to our internal resources and processes and so on. And of course, profit margins and, and other KPIs. And so, so this is the, the last part of this customer centricity piece, uh, which we wanted to share. Let me pause just for a moment and Shari, get your reflections or thoughts on, on this piece. Yeah, I, I think that was really well said. Um, I think, you know, um, uh, the, the, the notion that you need to find the right trade-off equation for a big market of customers is really, really important. And um, the example that comes to my mind right now is, is Airbnb. So offering a really, really different set of trade-offs, a really different value proposition um, that hotels traditionally had, but one that was really relevant to, you know, a pretty big market of customers. Um, so thinking really systematically about what are the levers that we can pull, what are the dials that we can turn up and down um, to design a trade-off uh, equation that's going to, you know, speak to and resonate to a large market of customers within the job to be done that we solve today is, I think, a question that companies should really keep front of mind. And one more thing I'll say before I'll, I'll hand back to Shari for closing remarks is that the customer definition of what a good trade-off equation is is constantly changing. Let's say you have a product you really like. You like the trade-offs. You thought it was good value for money. You like the features and functionality. But then you see your neighbor who has the same product with more features and functionality for half the price. Suddenly, you're not so happy with the trade-offs you were offered by, by the company that sold you the original product because you now have experience or you've seen another product which, which seems to have a much better trade-off equation. So the trade-off equation and how customers evaluate what is better is constantly evolving. And, and, and what used to be good and really compelling in three or four years is no longer that. And again, here we link back to value migration because as if there's a profitable problem, companies will come up with their own trade-off equation to solve that problem. And then again, the incumbents uh, may run into difficulty because suddenly there are many more products, uh, some of uh, which might, might have a better trade-off equation. So that's a lot of stuff we threw uh, at you in this in this short uh, webinar. I'll hand over for Shari just for one more slide to kind of summarize the key takeaways. 
and then we'll take some some questions in the in the chat. So I think I think just three points that that we'd recap. So uh, you know, there's an awful lot of really good thinking out there on this notion of of customer centricity. Um, that said, adopting you know customer centricity um, as a methodology can actually be really, really challenging because of the conflicting definitions that are out there, and critically, because focusing on a customer and understanding them and, and you know serving them holistically can be really, really challenging. Um, rather, adopting a mindset of customer job centricity can help companies focus on specific aspects of the customer that they can serve in really competitive, differentiated ways. So that's the first point um, of summary. The second is that this issue of value migration, um, as we hopefully brought to life just a little bit with a couple of the examples that we walk walked through, means that companies need to really think really often about how um, you know, they can identify new jobs to serve in cases where those that they've served today might face intensifying competition and commoditization, disruption from entrance into the space. Um, and then the third point is that when designing solutions to jobs to be done, it's really important to put yourself in the shoes of the customer and think about the trade-off equations that, you know, the things that they value in making the choice of solution to, sell, to solve a particular job um, and identifying the trade-off equations that are going to speak loudest to big customer segments. Um, so lots of content that we covered. I think we will, with that, switch to, to Q&A. Um, please do start uh, sending us your questions via the chat function. Um, we do have one in already, which is, uh, how do you find a common job to solve for a set of customers, i.e. a big enough universe, when every customer's circumstance is different with a different need? Um, Pontus, would you, would you like to offer first uh, reflections? Yeah, that's a, it's a very good question. And, and that kind of goes to, to, to one of the underlying issues, which is when is a problem valuable enough for a company to address it? And, and you, you know, we can't customize our solutions because companies, by definition, have to develop standardized solution if they want to serve a large market at scale. And, and I guess what, what we could say is that even though the circumstances are different, and people certainly have different characteristics and preferences and so on. There are these meta problems that are very big. Like you could take mobility as one, even though there are many different types of people who travel by train and they come from all walks of life and, and someone is in a rush and someone is on a holiday and someone is, is going to work or what have you, they still need to get from A to B. And so a train has been for a very long time uh, kind of a compelling solution, as has a car and a taxi and an Uber and, and so on. So there are these meta jobs, communication and you know transferring money and all kinds of other things that are that are large everyday problems that millions and even billions of people face. I think the real challenge, perhaps even more, is how do you find how or how do you improve on the trade-off equation for a big job? So a job, there is never a perfect solution. You know, a, a job is never perfectly satisfied because there's always a trade-off in the solution. So the key question I would be asking is, can we improve the trade-off equation of a big problem? And if you look at, for example, the news business, you could say that Twitter offers a very different trade-off equation than let's say the New York Times or BBC. But they are still in some shape or form in the news or communication business. And, and they offer a radically different trade-off equation compared to those established media companies. And I think the key question is, you know, how do we how do we improve the trade-off equation rather than can we find a problem that doesn't have any solutions? Uh, and of course, you know, even when we offer trade-offs, the trade-offs are never going to be perfect. They just have to be compelling to a large enough customer group. It's a, um, I'll, I'll just add one thought to that. It's an excellent question. Um, so the notion of finding a common job is a really important one. Um, and, you know, identifying to Pontus's point, you know, big spaces in which we can improve the trade-off equation is really, really powerful. Um, the, the other frame that I'll just offer on this is that um, uh, sometimes you can actually find distinct and different jobs that can have a common solution. So it's not necessarily that you need to find a common job for a common solution. You can actually find distinct jobs to be done 
that you can solve with a single solution. I'll, I'll come back to the example I gave um, uh, earlier of Pontus on his you know, morning trips to Starbucks. Um, Starbucks actually solves multiple different jobs to be done for different people. Um, for some, for some uh, you know, circumstances and customers, they solve the job to be done of help me socialize and, and you know, spend a little bit of quality time with, uh, with a friend or with a colleague. Um, for others, they solve the job to be done of energize me and get me ready for my day, uh, caffeinate me. Um, for others, they solve the job to be done in, in the increasingly you know, remote uh, virtual world that we work in of just get me out of the house. So it can actually also be the case that sometimes you can find distinct jobs to be done that a common solution can solve for. And there's a couple other questions we'll, we'll quickly hit. Um, value migration, how do you think about the cost to develop, maintain jobs over time in the context of value migration? Yeah, so that's a, that's a good question um, because value migrates slowly, it doesn't happen overnight. Um, and you know you can see that in, in declining margins, and and you can see that in the fact that customers aren't aren't so interested in in new features that are that are just kind of incremental. Uh, so I, I guess you know if one is cognizant of this, customers think in trade offs and value migrates, you can actually start to monitor it. You can start to say you can start to ask the question: How are competitors now? Uh, becoming, you know, becoming better, you know, uh, at, at, at addressing the job that, that we are, you know, working on and how, how, you know, much value is there in, in addressing a specific job? So those, those, those questions are, are, I think are, are, it's, it's helpful if you have a methodology and a common language, because then you can start to monitor them. But but it is tricky because it happens very slowly, and usually companies react only when it's when the situation is already quite quite dramatic. And that was certainly the case in this in this healthcare example, when after 10, 15 years, the margins had clearly declined, and and it was kind of a a, a little bit of a crisis to do something something about it. So um, I'd, I'd like to take us to a question that was um, posted in the chat, which is, how has the customer changed in the last decades? Are they still interested in big brands slash prestige, or do they now attach more importance to sustainable companies, fair trade, et cetera? Um, Pontus, would you like to offer first perspectives? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I would say that the customer trade-off equation has changed. I think... You know, we added one of the criteria we added in our meta categories is this this dial on values, and and you know I, I would say that 20 years ago we didn't talk so much about fair trade or or fair trade for the farmers and and now when you buy coffee or chocolate, very often you see that you know this is responsible coffee, this is fair trade, you know the local farmers are fairly compensated, this is ethically grown and so on and so forth. So clearly, that is a trade-off where the customers have said we're we're much more interested in in a product which offers us more comfort around the fact that this is ethically produced. So I think that's changed a lot. Of course, you've got that around you know carbon emissions and and all these topics and, and many other factors as well. So that is that is a new aspect of the trade-off equation which which wasn't not nearly as prominent twenty years ago. And this is the point about the about the trade-off equation that it's constantly changing because values change, society changes, mm -hmm. uh, and and suddenly people when they have two chocolate uh, bars or packages or coffee or what have you, and they're looking at them and they seem otherwise very similar. You know, it's the same roast and the same bean, and and one of them is fair trade, and the other is not. An increasing number of customers are saying, "I want the product that offers me this trade-off equation." With, which which means that it has a it scores higher on on those aspects around fair trade and uh, and and other values. So definitely that that fits in very nicely, and that was actually something we thought about when we were designing the dials on on the meta categories. There was one question also I saw on on and I think it was in the Q and A around kind of scientific evidence that they that jobs produce superior solutions, and and I guess. You know, I don't, I don't have any scientific studies on it, but I, I would just say this, that, you know, 
having having worked on these questions, you know, in in in, in our jobs and innovation and strategy for for better part of a decade, you know, you do see that that you know what what customers really care about in the end of the day is is a solution to their problem. If if you offer them a good solution or what they perceive to be a good solution to whatever problem they have, you know, usually uh, usually that's what they want. They don't care about anything else. I mean, if we think about it, again, like Ashari said in the beginning, all the products and services we buy or use, we buy them because we have jobs to be done or, or problems we need to address. And I think regardless of the language you use in, in a given company or any, any specific circumstance, you know, in the end of the day, great companies develop good solutions for important problems. And, and, and if you don't develop good solutions, customers are probably not going to, I mean, why would they buy anything from you if you don't have a good solution to an important problem? So I, I can't offer you a scientific, a scientific proof, but I think just, just thinking through the problem and thinking about our day-to-day -day life or even our life in a B2B setting, I mean, we engage with people who help us solve important jobs. And then we try to find the best solution, be it a washing machine or a car or a cup of coffee or chocolate bar or, or, or what have you. I think we have one, we have time for maybe one, one more if, if folks still have the time. There's a question on, on diabetes uh, management. Uh, yes, yes, yes. No, I think that's a, that's a nuanced uh, question and a very good one. I probably won't be able to do justice to it, but, but yes, of course there are, especially in, in many, many products and services, but certainly in healthcare, you know, you've got, you've got kind of a, you know, manage my manage my health, manage my health, or manage my you know clinical condition, and then there are all these other other things. And and the way we thought about it was that in the in the trade off equation, there are certain must have parameters without which you wouldn't even consider a product. So let's say in the diabetes one, you would say like the the key one is that the the drug works. Otherwise, I'm not even going to consider the drug if it doesn't work. Like it's a very short discussion. And then you've got other trade-offs like this drug offers great patient support. It manages my condition, it offers great patient support. The other drug manages my condition clinically, but doesn't offer patient support and, and, and is, is more expensive. So then you compare those two trade-offs and say, I actually want the drug that manages my condition, offers patient support and has the best price. And that's the trade-off equation that's most valuable. So we look at even that question through the trade-off equation that there are some things which are must-haves and it's a short discussion if the product doesn't offer it. Like, like air travel, it has to be safe. Like if it's not safe, you're not gonna fly. But then you might say, what's the trade-off equation in terms of the airport, you know, the, the, the routes, uh, the type of service and, and so on and so forth. So we, we look at even that question, we'll look through the, the trade-off equation, if, if that makes sense. I'll, I'll just add something then. I, I think it's a terrific question. Um, so, you know, thinking about um, the, the diabetes space and managing a chronic condition. So you might have an ultimate method job or goal, which is around, you know, help me live with and manage my diabetes as effectively as I possibly can. Then there's going to be multiple sort of sub jobs that sit underneath that. So some will relate to, to Pontus's point, help me manage my condition clinically, just, you know, get me the most effective results that I possibly can around my blood sugar, etc. There will be other jobs and that, that might be relatively well solved, there might be scope to solve it better. There will be other jobs to be done that are nested within the method job of help me live with diabetes that there might be more opportunity to solve and that companies haven't really focused on so much today. So for instance, it might be that if I have a chronic condition, something that's really important is helping me to communicate with those around me, be those, you know, my employer, what do I need from them? My, um, you know, partner, my family, what do I need them to do to help me live as effectively as I can um, with this condition? So I think certainly understanding the method job is really, really important. Breaking that down and understanding where are jobs to be done solved well today versus where do we have scope to really help the customer is a way to add an awful lot of value. Yeah, I'll do go rapid fire. It's excellent, excellent summary, Shari. Uh, I'll go rapid fire the last two questions. Do you see industries standardizing on trade outs over time? Yes, that's I would call that commoditization. When when competition sees a very compelling trade off equation but they can do it cheaper because they haven't had to invest in R&D and, and all the other uh, development costs. They can actually replicate the trade-off equation to a high degree of fidelity because they actually have the product. 
And their only question is, can we do it more cheaply or can we do it faster? So certainly, uh, certainly the, the, the case there. And emotional jobs to be done, uh, certainly a, a very important uh, question. And, and of course, we have functional jobs, emotional jobs and social jobs and so on. But, but when we think about you know, this, this topic of, let's take the fair trade topic again, you know, that the farmer, let's say the coffee package says that this is fair trade organic coffee. And it says even this is from a local farm here and here and here and so forth. That's an emotional job to be done. I mean, the chocolate will taste the same even without that label. And, and, and it's probably more expensive, but people don't care because they feel as an emotional and as a social uh, job to be done that, that they don't want to buy products that they don't think are fair. So, so, pu so putting and certifying that your product has been made with ethical standards or higher ethical standards than other products certainly addresses an emotional job, uh, which is important. And I think it's becoming increasingly important, these emotional and social jobs, partly because from a functional perspective, many jobs, uh, many solutions rather, many products and services are indistinguishable. But suddenly when someone is able to communicate to those emotional jobs, and sometimes it's just communication, uh, uh, but, but in the fair trade one, of course, there's a lot of certification that needs to be taken care of. But, but regardless, social emotional jobs are certainly becoming, I, I would argue, more important in, in many categories. We're, we're hitting 55 minutes, Shari. So I, th I think we, we, should, we should try to wrap up. It's been an interesting discussion uh, and, and lots of very good questions. I'm sorry we didn't get quite to, to, to all of them. And, and you know, we, we have some collateral around uh, jobs to be done, some, some what we call three pagers, which basically summarize the concepts we talked about here. And, and if you want, want, want to access those, uh, uh, feel free to reach out uh, to, to the email, email address. Uh, and and also we are developing a, a virtual training model on this. So if you're interested, feel free to drop a, a, a note to to Inisite Marketing, and, and we can follow up. But it's been uh, delightful to to have you here. Thank you for joining us for this hour. Uh, thank you for all your questions and and your participation. Thank you all so much.